My dearly beloved, I believe it is very appropriate that we cover the 28th lesson of the Baltimore Catechism on Holy Communion on the feast of our Lord Jesus Christ the King. This feast of Christ the King was established by His Holiness Pope Pius XI in the year 1925, a holy year. It was established for the purpose of proclaiming and striving to recognize the kingship of Christ, which is always there, whether men pay homage to it or not. And of course, at that time, there was trouble in Mexico, there was trouble in Spain. Catholics were persecuted and put to death in the 1920s and 1930, early 1930s. And so it was necessary for the Pope to proclaim and establish a feast in honor of the kingship of Christ. And in his encyclical establishing this feast, Pope Pius XI said that Christ is king by nature, by inheritance, and by conquest. And what he meant to say by that is Christ is king by nature because he's God. Automatically, as God, he is king of heaven and earth. He is also king by inheritance because he's the only begotten son of God the Father. And so he inherits from his father mastery, you might say, over the created universe, kingship over all of mankind, all creatures. But he is also king by conquest. By his death on the cross, he's earned the title of king. And he deserves, in every way, our homage, our love, our loyalty, and our worthy subjection. Our divine Lord is not recognized by very many people as king. But he truly reigns as the king over those who love him in the Blessed Sacrament. We refer to our divine Lord as the king of love, a prisoner of love in the tabernacle. And you remember when we first began a couple of weeks ago these three lessons on the Holy Eucharist, the Catechism states that our Lord is present in the Blessed Sacrament for three reasons. He is there to be contained, to be present, that he might be visited, adored, worshipped. When we come to the church to make our visits, he is there that he might be offered to his Father in Mass as the true oblation. And our Divine Lord is there in the Blessed Sacrament that he might be received by the faithful in Holy Communion. This is what we would call an invention of love. And as Bishop Altenbach said a couple of years ago, who would have ever even thought to ask Almighty God to give us the Blessed Sacrament if our Lord himself did not do it? Supposing that our Lord went through his earthly existence preaching and teaching, working miracles, and nothing was said about giving us his body and blood. And finally came the Last Supper, no institution of the Holy Eucharist, our Lord's death on the cross, his resurrection, and then ascension into heaven. And nothing is said about the Holy Eucharist. Who would ever have ever thought to ask our Lord to give us his body and blood as spiritual food? No one would have ever even considered such a thing. It took the love, the uncreated love of Almighty God himself to give us his own body and blood in Holy Communion. What is Holy Communion? Holy Communion is the receiving of Jesus Christ in the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. What is necessary to receive Holy Communion worthily? Three things are necessary to receive Holy Communion worthily, three main things. First, it is necessary to be free from mortal sin, to be in the state of grace. Secondly, it is necessary to have a right intention. In other words, someone must have a proper intention, not just simply going to Holy Communion because everyone else does, because it is the thing to do, or because someone wants us, your parents want you to go to Communion, but to go to Communion from a proper motive, for the love of God, to receive grace, to receive spiritual strength, that would be a right intention. And thirdly, we must obey the church's laws on the fast required before Holy Communion out of reverence for the body and blood of our Lord. However, there are some cases in which Holy Communion may be received without fasting, such as danger of death. Now, these are the three conditions necessary to make a worthy Holy Communion a good communion. To be in the state of grace, to have the proper intention or motive and to observe the church's laws on the fast required. He who knowingly receives Holy Communion in mortal sin 
receives the body and blood of Christ indeed, but he does not receive his graces and commits a grave sin of sacrilege. And as you know of all the sacraments that can be received unworthily, to receive this one unworthily, the Holy Eucharist, would be the greatest of sacrileges, the, the worst of the sacrilegious receptions of any sacrament. Do venial sins render us unworthy of Holy Communion? Venial sins, even though they are numerous and deliberate, do not render us unworthy of Holy Communion, but they do prevent us from receiving the more abundant graces, which otherwise we would receive from Holy Communion. Now, have you ever wondered why the confitier is said by the server right before Holy Communion is distributed? You've already said the confitier at the beginning of Mass. Why is it said again before Holy Communion? The reason it is said a second time is because the confitier is a sacramental which remits venial sins for those who are properly disposed. And we should strive to be as purified as possible to make a good act of contrition before Holy Communion. To confess in the confitier, as we say it silently along with the servers before Communion, our sins to Almighty God, our sinfulness, that our sins might be remitted. What should we do to receive more abundantly the graces of Holy Communion? To receive more abundantly the graces of Holy Communion, we should strive to be most fervent and to free ourselves from deliberate venial sin. We should strive to be most fervent, avoiding a sense of routine about receiving Holy Communion. You should spend some time before Holy Communion making acts of faith, hope, and charity. You can say the acts of faith, hope, and charity, which every Catholic should know by heart before communion, or you can make the same acts in your own words. Tell our Lord you believe he's there. Tell our Lord you trust his goodness. And tell our divine Lord that you love him and that you want to love him even more. Now, in addition to acts of faith, hope, and love, we should add, or I always encourage the faithful to add an act of desire. The saints tell us that what we ardently desire, we receive. That what we earnestly desire is granted to us at least in merit. There are some saints who in a short few years in the religious life or few years in this world attained an eminent degree of sanctity and we are told they did so because they had the great desire. We read examples of the lives of the saints of individuals who wanted to go to Holy Communion and they couldn't. And they received some kind of heavenly visitation or guarantee that they received the same graces that they would have received had they been able to go to communion because they wanted so badly to go to communion. And that's why a spiritual communion is so meritorious. Because a spiritual communion is simply the desire to receive Holy Communion. That's all it is, the desire that our Lord would come into you physically. But although he cannot, he comes spiritually. So in addition to your acts of faith, hope, and charity, add an act of desire, telling the Lord that you desire to be as worthily prepared as you possibly could be for communion. And also the act of contrition, to tell our Lord you're sorry for your sins. Does the church now command us to fast from midnight before Holy Communion as was formerly done? The church does not now command us to fast from midnight before Holy Communion as was formerly done. The laws enacted by Pope Pius XII now regulate this matter by the number of hours we must fast. The laws of fasting for Holy Communion enacted by Pope Pius XII in the 1950s are as follows, and these should be followed most exactly. Water may be taken at any time before Holy Communion without breaking the fast. Sick persons, though not confined to bed, may receive Holy Communion after taking medicine or non-alcoholic drinks. A priest permission is not necessary. If someone is very ill, for instance, he could drink milk or juice and go to communion even 10, 15 minutes after that. So sick persons, although not confined to bed, may receive Holy Communion after taking medicine or non-alcoholic drinks. A priest permission is not necessary, although I would say if there is a doubt, then the priest should be asked whether a person is really sick enough to take advantage of that permission. Thirdly, all Catholics may receive Holy Communion after fasting three hours from food and alcoholic drinks and one hour from non-alcoholic drinks. 
This applies to Holy Communion at midnight mass, as well as at mass is celebrated in the morning, afternoon, or evening. A priest permission is not necessary. So that's the point that all should especially take notice of. Three hours for solid foods, and that would include liquids that would be equivalent of solid, like a milkshake, eggnog, something like that. One hour for non-alcoholic liquids. Now, if you have something like orange juice, it has a lot of sediment, a lot of solids in it, it should be strained out. It should be a liquid for one hour fast. Catholics are urged to observe the Eucharistic fast from midnight as was formerly done and also to compensate for the use of the new privileges by works of charity and penance. But these practices are not obligatory. Finally, one who has already received Holy Communion may not receive the Blessed Sacrament again on the same day except in danger of death. And that's the only time when you can receive Holy Communion another time, a second time on the same day unless you're a priest and celebrate several masses on one day. So make certain that you know carefully these laws and if you have a question about them, they're printed on the back side of your calendar. And so just take your church calendar and turn up the bottom and on the back side you will see there are the laws for Holy Communion. We should not time our Holy Communion down to the minute to the point where we simply fast day after day just three hours before Holy Communion. That's not the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law is to enable those who couldn't fast from midnight to receive Holy Communion often, even daily, but we should still maintain our reverence for Holy Communion. Now, these laws must be observed exactly. You must have your fast down, supposing you, only, you had eaten only three hours before, it must be three complete hours, even down to the minute before you receive Holy Communion. You don't have to worry about seconds, but you do have to worry about three complete hours down to the minute. Holy Communion may be received without fasting when one is in danger of death or when it is necessary to save the Blessed Sacrament from insult or injury. How should we prepare for Holy Communion? We should prepare for Holy Communion by thinking of our Divine Redeemer, whom we are about to receive, and by making fervent acts of faith, hope, love, and contrition, and like I said, an act of desire, which is very beneficial. What should we do after Holy Communion? After Holy Communion, <clears throat> we should spend some time adoring our Divine Lord, thanking Him, renewing our promises of love and obedience to Him, asking Him for blessings for ourselves and others. The most important time of your day and the most important time of your life are those periods of time when you have our Divine Lord in you, body and blood, soul and divinity the Holy Eucharist. You are a living tabernacle. When you come up here and receive Holy Communion, as you're walking back to your place, there is no difference between you and that tabernacle on the altar. As sacred as is the tabernacle on the altar, you are equal to it, you might say, when you receive Holy Communion. God is living in you, truly, for about 15 minutes after Holy Communion. What do you do to reverence his presence. You should be recollected. You should not look around after Holy Communion. You should spend the time in prayer, talking to our Lord and asking for much, for all that you need. He wants us to ask. He loves those petitions. Make acts of adoration, of thanksgiving, of reparation, and above all, of petition. Do it in your own words. Put your face in your hands. Close your eyes and spend some time talking to our Lord. When you run out of ideas, things to think about, things to say, then take your missal or a little prayer book and read prayers that have been written for after Holy Communion. But don't just allow your mind to wander. Spend as much time as you can making prayers of your own thoughts and then use a prayer book, a missal that has prayers written for Thanksgiving. But don't rely too much on one or the other. If you try and spend the whole time with your own thoughts, then you might begin to daydream and wander. Your mind will wander, and you'll lose the merit of that time. On the other hand, you shouldn't spend all the time just simply reading prayers from a prayer book because then it will become mere routine, and there will not be the interior devotion. So I suggest that when you return from Holy Communion up until the priest continues the Mass, you spend that time in your own private prayers and devotions 
with your own thoughts and your own words. And then after Mass is over during our Thanksgiving after Mass, then use your prayer book. That is not a hard and fast rule. You set your own standards for what helps you. And that is the important thing, that you are able to spend the time devoutly, properly, and with most fruit. That's the criterion. One point here should be noted. What should be observed in receiving Holy Communion? In receiving Holy Communion, these points should be observed. Number one, we should be neat and clean in appearance. Whenever you go to Mass, your exterior appearance should be neat and in good order, and especially when you receive Holy Communion. Secondly, we should approach the communion rail and return from it respectfully with our hands joined. Thirdly, we should raise the head and extend the tongue sufficiently. You should extend your tongue past your lips to receive Holy Communion. And you should tilt your head back sufficiently, open your mouth sufficiently wide so that the priest can give you Holy Communion becomingly. And fourthly, we should swallow the sacred host as soon as possible. If you received the sacred host and then you allowed it to dissolve in your mouth and did not swallow it, in effect, you did not receive Holy Communion. You must swallow the host to receive communion. So make certain that you take note of that. I will tell you right now one thing that I don't care for on boys is tennis shoes, either on Sundays or weekdays. Because when we go to Mass, we should have a set of clothing, or we should have a set of standards, you might say, that sets Mass apart from other functions. We should not wear ordinary clothing to Mass, even on weekdays or Saturdays. Unless someone is working right after Mass and couldn't change, then fine. But keep in mind that the Mass is sacred. It is important. It is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And we should be becomingly dressed for it. How long a time should we spend in Thanksgiving after Holy Communion? After Holy Communion, we should spend at least about 15 minutes in Thanksgiving because our Lord remains with us about that length of time. Now, when you go to Mass, that much time is spent. By the time Mass is over, it's been maybe 10 minutes, maybe already 15 minutes. We make some Thanksgiving time after Mass to make certain it's been a full 15 minutes. But what about the times when you receive Holy Communion outside of Mass? For example, during Lent. We will have Holy Communion in the morning, maybe around 6.20 or 6.30 for those who work and want to receive Holy Communion during Lent. And it's outside of Mass. You should make certain that you spend the proper time of Thanksgiving. We should never allow ourselves to get into the routine of receiving Holy Communion, making a very short Thanksgiving, and then leaving the church. But to make always a proper Thanksgiving after Mass, that's one of the reasons why so many Catholics lost the Blessed Sacrament because there was not given to our Lord proper reverence and devotion. What are the chief effects of a worthy Holy Communion? The chief effects of a worthy Holy Communion are first, a closer union with our Lord and an increase of love for our Lord. Second, an increase of sanctifying grace. Third, preservation from mortal sin and the remission of venial sin. And fourth, the lessening of our inclination to sin and the help to practice good works. All of these wonderful benefits come to you when you make a good Holy Communion. It might not be as fervent as it should be or could be, but for every worthy Holy Communion, those benefits come to your soul. When are we obliged to receive Holy Communion? We are obliged to receive Holy Communion during Easter time each year and when in danger of death. Why is it well to receive Holy Communion often, even daily? It is well to receive Holy Communion often, even daily, because this intimate union with Jesus Christ the source of all holiness and the giver of all graces is the greatest aid to a holy life. While we should receive Holy Communion, if we're properly prepared, every chance we get, we must not allow it to become a mere routine and nothing more. And that's what we must guard against. Always to have proper preparation. You come into a church and Holy Communion is being distributed, and just to go right up and receive Holy Communion, no. Always spend some time preparing ahead of time. And if you feel you're too distracted, you're not prepared, even though you're in the state of grace, better to not receive communion and risk becoming accustomed in an improper way to receiving our Lord, developing a sense of routine. Better to not receive Holy Communion on that day 
rather than to develop that routine, lose your love for our Lord and your sense of fervor and piety and develop again a mere routine, which is risking also unworthy communions by developing that routine. Always we must maintain our reverence. We must not be so impressed with the, with the presence of our Lord that we fear to approach him. And yet, on the other hand, we must not become so familiar that we approach without preparation. So have the proper balance between fear and love. Don't lose your fear altogether and never fail to love our Lord and to prepare worthily to receive him. What is a spiritual communion? A spiritual communion is an act of faith and love toward our Lord in the Holy Eucharist with an ardent desire to receive him. This act can be made as often as we wish and is very pleasing to our Lord and very meritorious. How should we re show our gratitude to our Lord for remaining always on our altars? We should show our gratitude to our Lord for remaining always on the altars in Holy Eucharist by visiting him often, by reverence in church, by assisting at weekday mass when this is possible, by attending parish devotions, and by being present at benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. It is well for all of us to examine our conscience. We religious live under the same roof with our Eucharistic King. We can go and visit him in chapel many times a day. All of you live within a sufficiently close distance to a, one of our chapels, to a chapel, that you can go and visit our Lord. How often do you do so? Do your visits to our Lord justify your Catholic faith? Do they justify his being present on the altar? Let us today on the Feast of Christ the King make a little examination of conscience. What is our reverence for the Blessed Sacrament like? What is our preparation for Holy Communion? How do we receive our Lord in Holy Communion? If our Lord were to, in the Blessed Sacrament, appear to us as he was when he traveled the earth and were to speak to us, would he be pleased with our Holy Communions? The author of The Imitation of Christ gives a very interesting comparison. He says, supposing there were one priest in all the United States or in the world, one priest in our country who said Mass once a year, on one day of the year, let's say it was the Feast of Christ the King, there was one Mass in one city in the United States, and that was it. People would flock for miles to attend that Mass, and that was the only Mass at which Holy Communion could be received. Would we not do anything to get to that city and to receive Holy Communion? What if it were once every 10 years that you could receive Holy Communion? And unfortunately, through the grace of frequent Holy Communion, there can grow a lack of reverence. We must be very careful not to allow that to happen. Love our divine Lord. Prove your love for him by the manner in which you receive Holy Communion. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.